Bless the Lord. Good evening, Fellowship Church. Welcome. All right, it's good to be with everybody tonight. So, good to see everybody. And thank you, Father. We give you all glory, God. You are worthy of all praise and all honor. Thank you, God. If we do not give praise, not only to you, God the Father, but to the Lord Jesus, the rocks will cry out. So, Father, let, let that not be necessary tonight. Let us give you praise and all glory and honor. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Prepare our hearts to worship you and cover us with the, the precious blood of Jesus so that we can be holy in all things that we offer to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Awesome is the sight of your holiness, majestic is your purity, your righteousness shines brighter than the sun on me. Awesome is the sight. Of your holiness, majestic is your purity, your righteousness.
Father, we are alive because you live. And in fact, everything that's alive is alive because you live, God. There is nothing that we see that your hands did not make, O oh God, at the foundation of the earth. Thank you, Father. So we lift you high tonight, God. We exalt you tonight. We give all praise and honor. To the Lord God who made the heavens and the earth. Thank you, Father. And to Jesus, his only begotten Son. The only one actually conceived in the womb by the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself, the very manifestation of God on earth. We give all praise and honor to you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. All right. Amen. Man. All right. Amen. Hallelujah, glory. <laughs> Sounds like I'm on. Praise the Lord. I'm kind of wanting to jump into the testimony, but I want to get a head start on the prayers. Um, crying out to the Lord for the health and well being. Uh, Steve, do I want to pull that microphone off or am I all right? He says I'm all right. Okay. But Lord, we do lift up Shepherd Primo and all of Ray and Betty's adult children and all of their grandchildren with particular blessing of health and well being on that Remo family. Now I got an echo. Like there's two of me. Also, for Michelle Corley, 
is it in intensive care? She's part of the older crowd that we used to meet on the home groups over at John Jones' house. She and her late husband, Jim, would be over there. And now Michelle is, a, is in need of God's healing touch. Thank you and praise you, Lord, for meeting her need. You are the great physician, the creator, the healer. You know each atom in her body is needed. We shout out praise to you and thanksgiving. Also, forgive me, Lord, but I do have some concerns for my grandchild. Three-year-old Ezekiel. Glory to God. We, Marcus and I and, um, and my daughter Sammy, we got to go up to Richmond this Sunday to visit with the kids. That Bryson and Ezekiel are in foster care. Uh, Sam was was caught in drug use. Long story short, they took the kids. Well, we're in the process of getting them back. Thank you, Jesus. I believe it is your will. Sammy's been working so hard. She's been working at Kentucky Fried Chicken in, in Front Royal. She's got her own little apartment. She's paying her own rent. She's paying her own electric bill. She's working hard, and I pray your peace on Sammy. Lord, she... She cried all last week about being stressed out, you know, because it's like every other weekend we uh, are promised by Department of Social Services and foster care in Richmond, DSS in, in Front Royal, you know, they're supposed to let us go up there for a visit for a couple hours each Saturday or whatever it works out to their schedule. And the communications is, is difficult. Things that people aren't living up to their job responsibilities and so forth. We have another court date on March the 8th regarding the custody. It's not likely that Sammy will get custody back at this time. The courts and Department of Social Services are kind of looking for we need to have some unsupervised visitation and even working towards weekend visitations. They still have us wanting to, to jump through some hoops and Sammy's just doing everything that she's told. We pray, Lord, that you would be the Lord of this situation and helping Sammy to get her children back in our home. And when they are back in our home, and I say it, I'm the first to say that I'm there in support and helping her through her parenting on a regular basis. She's going to need help. Her mom is no longer living there in Front Royal, so her help is, I'd say, limited. She has none. Okay, so for Sammy and for Ezekiel and for Bryson, pray for uh, my daughter April, who's recovering from a recent car accident a couple weeks ago. And let's see. So, hey, I fit my, my testimony in there already. But the, the visit, we went to uh, one of those play zones. What was it called? The Kids Empire. It was like going into the McDonald's play, z play zone, but like three stories high. And as wide as this room is long. And the kids had fun for three hours. But Ezekiel, the three-year-old, you know, I, I can't begin to try to guess what his problems is. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a child psychologist. But you know, he's got his mom there for a couple hours and then she's gone and you wanna know why he's throwing stuff around the room. And he's doing that at daycare. And daycare has given the foster parents two weeks notice. You can't get this kid under control. He's going to have to find someplace else to spend his days. So I pray God's peace on little Ezekiel. Bryson's doing wonderful. Bryson's six. He's on the basketball team at school. He's having fun with his peers on the team. He's doing great at school. I pray, Lord, you're likewise. Your peace for Ezekiel. And, you know, just in the order of trying to be specific towards our prayers, again, Sammy was using drugs while she was carrying Ezekiel in the womb. So if you want to say he's a drug baby, if that's part of it, I, you know, the Lord knows, and he knows what that child needs. I say that the enemy, you know, you got no authority here. Sammy and her children are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we, we speak deliverance for Sammy for April. Um, we have an individual here, is it Maxine? No, that's for the broken shoulder. Caitlin. Caitlin is having 
bondage to drugs, uh, to put it bluntly. Addiction, bondage, we, we cry out, Lord, for deliverance. So I've got to jump into my prayer list. Thank you, Lord, for answering these prayers. I don't have specifics. I always like to do, and I get, you know, kind of the umbrella thing. People are in need of physical healing, relationship healings, and uh, uh, emotional unrest and that kind of thing. People needing jobs, people needing housing, people needing health insurance. With that, Lord, we're going to jump in too. Jalen Allman, Maddie Andrenson, Caleb Bailey, still incarcerated, as is Michelle Park and Cindy Levering, and Greg Foster. Still got a couple more years somewhere over there on the Eastern Shore. And uh, Marcus and I continue to pray for him and Marcus's cousins, uh, Greg Jr. and, and uh, Aaliyah, who prays for them nightly, and their mom, their mom Ashley, who's doing a wonderful job as a single mom working at Walmart or wherever she's at now and raising those kids. Over there in, in, at the Royal, Royal Arms Apartments, right across where Marcus had been residing until I got him a year ago. So conveniently, the, um, the elementary school is right across the street. Kids can walk across the street. Crossing guard gets them across the street at the school and vice versa when it's time to get out. And there's a half a dozen moms, single moms, that help each other out. It's a difficult situation at best. <laughs> Lord, you're blessing their Royal Arms Apartments and those moms who are taking care of their kids. Carolyn Beeman, Kim Belusi, Carol Bowie, Dana Brown, Harry and Roxanne Burgers, Doris Chesser, Marissa Crown, Ashley Enstrom, and her sons Aiden and Emily. Thank you, Father, for your continued strength and encouragement for Ashley. She's being a wonderful mom and niece, keeping those boys being reared up like they're supposed to be. We're praying for Bethany, Rick, Emily L. Gibson, Jesse Gilroy, Penny Griffith, Dory Hardesty, Kimberly Harris, Dale Hay, Bruni Heath, comma, her mother and daughter, Michelle, Ed Horn, and let me see, we got Sarah Eisenhart, Maria Jones, yesterday fell again, there's a notation and son Chuck Jones, Robin Keyes, Margaret King, Stan Kaczewski, Brother Joe and the mom Dixie, Cindy Loring, Sheila Lundstrom, the Melberg family, including Pat's mom Doris, Jane Mathail, Carolyn McCon McConkey, uh, Bill, comma, Heather, and Axel McGonagall, Lau Moore, Mike Morris, Jerry and Linda Muchow, Michelle Park, we've already mentioned her, <coughs> Purdy, Mrs. Purdy, Emily Remo, Brian and Brooklyn, comma, Tyler Roberts, the Santucci family, Melissa Seacrest, Garnett Anderson and her son Brian, Terry Apperson, Brandon Baldwin, Dottie Bedell, Gary Beeman and family, Debbie Boer, Charles Bridget, Jacob Burke, Helen Cooper, Denise Culberson, Cheryl Farr, and Lord, we're still trusting in you to send that buyer to Cheryl's house to purchase that thing at a reasonable price. Thank you, Jesus. Any wisdom that's needed that you'll give that to Cheryl and Marvin as he's working together with his daughter to uh, liquidate that house. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Yvonne Gibson, Linda Grady, Joan Hall, and Steve Hall Sr. Uh, I'm seeing a, a notation to sign Yvonne Gibson, Mary Gibson, kidney, something to do with the kidney. Donna Harris, and uh, uh, Pastor son Tommy Harris, and his wife Lisa, and their children. <coughs> Jeremy and Cass Heat, Christopher Hidalgo, Joseph Houston, Tony Insco, Joey and Mary, Joseph, comma, Kelly and family, Doug King, Ginger and A.J. Conigan. 
Carrie Langley, Nellie Linder, Ken and Lorraine Mahan, Ella and Evan Mason, Carrie McClure, Denise McKilley, Al and Mary Jane Mills, Trudy Monroe. Let me slip in before I forget my own mom, who's home at home, we're doing an at home hospice. A handful of uh, my siblings and I are caring for mom, we're taking turns. And we are getting much, much better at you know, working with each other and not getting angry, but I mean, particularly Marie is doing such a wonderful job in uh, scheduling who's going to be on and when. We just pray for God's continued blessing. And Marie and I pray for Mom today. She's got a very uncomfortable cough. She does have lung cancer. She's diagnosed with lung cancer. They say it's metastasized from the top of the lung to the bottom of the lung. Anyway, she may have several months, what have you. But it is our prayer that our mother would have optimum comfort and that she would be comfortable and not, you know, Lord, when it's time that you want to call her home, that it would be without a great struggle or gasping for breath or that kind of thing. Maybe she'd just pass away, pass away in a peaceful sleep. Lord, we pray your mercy and your love, and you know, you, you love her more than even I do. And, my siblings, but thank you, Lord, for taking care of mom in that situation. Praying for Charles Newman and family, Joe Phillips, Andy Rander, Owen Riley, uh, Debbie Roberts, comma, Pat, comma, Paul, and Samantha, Eleanor Sayers, Jordan Schrader, and the, the baby. Lord, whatever it is that that baby needs, we cry out to you. Strengthen that child. A child's immune system, heal it completely. A few more names I have here for Massey Shumpert, had to do with surgery. Betty Stepp, Michelle Sullivan, T. Tex and John, Lane Turner, Mike Twig, Madison Wade and family, Carla Whitley, Michelle Waddell, Fitzpa James Fitzpatrick, Kristen Stockman, Aiden Sweeney, Rejoice Tenerif, Barb Tuttle, Glenda Verley's mother, Lillian, Bob Wynn, Robbie and Madison Williams. Jensen is in ICU. Anything else on that, Pastor? Jensen at the bottom of the list in ICU intensive care. Jensen, just a single name. Well, the Lord knows, and we pray, Lord, you meet that need of healing. Praying for Israel, the peace of Israel, and all the other countries, particularly out there in the Middle East, praying your peace. For diseases, including the COVID and its variants, and those who are suffering from the so-called shots to keep them from getting the disease or the illness. I believe that my granddaughter, Kayla, had some side effects from her immune shots. And those who are in, in the military is Jacob Houston, Ashley Baldo, Billy Heath, Anthony Baldo, Charlie Burke, Brandon Hardesty, Adam Corey. And with that, we go, well, we just close in prayer. Thanking you, Lord, that you have called us. And in obedience, Lord, we come together in um, fellowship, trusting and believing and uh, I guess the majority, if not all, of our faith is your gift. Your word tells us that our faith is a gift that you've given us. So we practice it and we try to build it. We thank you, Lord, for answering these prayers. Lord, we encourage, we pray that you would encourage those who have had answered prayer to let us know so we can uh, en encourage those who are so faithfully praying on this prayer list. In Jesus' name, and we've got Bill Heath with a good lesson for us tonight. Come on up here and take over, Bill. Pastor. Okay. Good evening, Fellowship Church. Glad to see that you.
change. <laughs> Doesn't make too much difference. That happens. Well, praise the Lord for another day, the life of faith in Christ. It has many curves and turns, but we know the destination, and we know the one that's carrying us through. We're going to continue in the book of Judges character studies. We've been going over Gideon. Let me pray before we start. Lord, not unto us, Lord, not unto us, but to thy name be the glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Amen. Anytime you get into the word and you teach it, you always should be asking yourself, how does it apply to me first before you're able to teach it? Because if we aren't obeying it, the one that's teaching or preaching, it kind of falls. And this series in the, the Judges from Hebrews 11, chapter 32 covers four judges, and we're, we're almost finished. And with Gideon, we see in chapter 6, 7, and 8, plus 9, is that he started out as a nobody. And you could say as a coward, fearful, all three of them. And God took care of those because God called them for a purpose. And he was going to fulfill God's purpose. And then in chapter 7, there's great victory. So we can say that he went from being a nobody to faith. Or else you could say he went from fear to faith. Or he went from coward to courage. They all... They all just six and seven is you often hear those chapters together, especially seven. This morning, I was led, waking up early to listen to a man that I know from the Navy, a retired chief. Now he's a dean at Hillsdale College. And he was given a motivational talk to uh, college campus, their chapel. And he just happened to be covering Judges, Gideon, chapter 6 and 7. And also the Gideons International, a group of businessmen and professionals began in 1899 up to the present. They take chapter 7 for their name, for the organization. And they're still holding true to their basic fundamentals of the faith. Although United Kingdom kind of went away because they withdrew from the Gideons International, most of them, because they didn't think women were equal with men in their membership. But they don't understand the difference in England. God designed us different. But that's the way the world's going. Now, chapter 8 and 9, I wish wasn't in the Bible. Because after Gideon faces his fear and being a coward, and then he gets faith and courage because of his faith, now he thinks he's somebody because he had a victory in his life. And when you think you're a somebody, it's just as, it's worse than being a nobody. And in between is the life of faith. We're not a nobody because we're all equal in the eyes of God. But we're not somebody either. It's a life of faith. And I wish we could have stayed at chapter 7 and just not continue. However, the scriptures are written for our learning, the Old Testament. Romans 15, 4. 
Now let's get into chapters 8 and 9 because he's going to go from faith to failure. He's going to go from courage to compromiser. And we'll see how those steps in chapter 8 and 9 play out. And the enemy is not himself at the beginning. The enemy isn't external, the Midianites. The enemy is internal within his own people of the faith, Israel. Not a conquering enemy from outside. This is from within. So I think there's really good lessons to learn as we go to the outline of chapters 8 and 9. Start with chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. And the men of Ephraim said unto Gideon, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou did not call us when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites, and they did chide with him sharply? So this tribe, his brothers, who were down south, and this was a strong tribe of Ephraim. But God didn't say call them. He called the ones north of where he was in Manasseh, on west of the Jordan River. But they got jealous after the battle. When he won the battle. And then they come on, how come you didn't call us? And they scolded him sharply. This is the enemy within. And he said to them, what have I done now in comparison of you? Then he told them, the, the grapes, grapes of Ephraim are better than the vintage of Abiezer. You know, your, your land is fruitful. Then he comforts them. He gives a soft answer. He's using wisdom. God has delivered into your hands the princes of Median, Oreb, and Zeb, talked of in chapter 7. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? They had a great victory in conquering these leaders of the enemy. Then their anger was abated. So he took care of that one good when he said that. The next enemy is within from the tribe of Gad. They're east of the Jordan. The next two groups. The men of Sukkoth. Sukkoth is a city in the tribe of Gad. And what happened with them? He's chasing his 300 men, 10,000 or 13,000 that are going south because he just had a great victory, 300 against 132,000. There's still 13,000 left. And he needs food for his troops. They're hungry. They're in hot pursuit to finish the job. Because they never have a, they're going to really finish a job and the Midianites are not going to come back again because he finishes the job properly. What happened? He wanted uh, some food. And what did they say in verse 7? Well, verse 6, the last part. That we should give bread unto thy army because they had not captured everyone, the princes, the leaders of the other enemy. And then Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zulumna into my hand, then I'll tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. He's going to come back later and actually do this, where he's going to draw them through some thorny bushes to wound them and hurt them. Then the Next enemy within is the men of Penuel. And know that this, when it says men, it does not say the Penuelans, uh, uh, the other tribes, Sukuthians, as some Bibles say. It uses man, which is a male noun. <laughs> it can't be neuter or you remove that male masculinity out of your Bible, which some versions do. 
and he wanted food from them. And what did they say? Verse 8, when I come in peace again, I will break down this tower. And he's going to do that when he comes back and returns from his victory. Then Gideon has victory in verses 10 to 14. We won't read that. Verse 15 to 17, he comes back and he beats the men of Sukkot, draws them through the thorns and wounds them. Then he's actually going to slay the men of the city of the tower when he beats it down. They're going to die, the second city. And I don't think Gideon did it himself. He had others do it. And you'll see why in a little bit here, the next section. The fourth enemy, we'll see in verses 20 and 21. He caught two of the kings, and he said to Jether, his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth threw not his sword, for he feared, because he was yet a youth. So he's telling his son, his firstborn, so his oldest son, you killed him. But he was young. He He never killed nobody. And I'm thinking, has Gideon actually killed anyone with his own hand yet? He's a leader, but has he as a warrior, as a soldier, because of the next verse. Then Zeba and Zabuna said, Rise, thou, and fall upon us. For as the man is, so is his strength. So he's saying, you're not really a soldier. You're not a man getting your child to do this, to kill us. They were soldiers and warriors. So that, that makes me think that Some of his cowardice is coming back, is revealing itself, not coming back. It's still there underneath, like sometimes our old man, our old life comes out if we don't keep following the Lord the way we should. Then he slew them and took away the ornaments that were on the camel's neck. So I take that as cowardice, and and he's looking at wealth now. We're going to see he's going to look more and more at that. Coming with leadership and victory is money and how it affects him. The fifth, verse 22 to 26, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son. Be our king, like the other nations. This isn't Saul yet. This is the only one that they're saying, Be our king. Kind of early, book of Judges. This is going to go to his head. And we'll see. And, and pride's going to come in as part of his fall. Is there anything wrong with the king? Yes, because it isn't God's time. Just as in the time of Moses, God ruled through a man and then through 70 that helped him. It was a time of a monarchy, God ruling through that man. Now it's a time of judges, almost like another dispensation. He's ruling through these judges, not kings like the other nations had all around them. Well, let's play this out, how it relates to his, relates to his failure. Is, it's sort of similar as today, we want to think there's apostles and prophets. There was a time for that. But for today, it's not God's time. That's already passed. Verse 24, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey, of the victory. Give the earrings, for they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So he collects a lot of gold. And what's he going to do with his gold? His next failure leads to this. Verse 27, all alone. And this is what you say, enemy coming in, number six. 
and Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. An ephod is an image. It's not the type that the priest wore, but it's made of gold that he put in his city. Maybe he said, hey, this was a great victory. We, we want to remember that victory. This is like a trophy made of gold from the enemy. That past event. This is an image or idol. The last part of the verse will bear that out. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it. Which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. As the father goes, it affects the children, the leader of the family. And what else does he do after this? Well, the sixth enemy attacking him, verse 31. Well, he took many wives, verse 29. He went back to his town in his own house, and he took threescore and ten sons, or had them, of his own body begotten, for he had many wives. So he took upon himself many wives. You do that in those times to show your prosperity, your position. And it was even against the law of Moses where he said the kings were not to take many wives onto themselves. They were not to accumulate gold or accumulate horses. Because their power, their victory in the Lord is not in how big a military you have. If God is on your side. At least then. And it's not how much money you have or riches. And it's not how many women you have. However, besides that, verse 31 is the kicker to show his failure, his compromise, and his concubine that was in Shechem, that is not the city he's in, it's a few hours away, that'll come Shechem, that city which is one of the six Levitical cities, that they had cities of refuge established by Moses. Um, special cities throughout Israel. She also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. So he called the son's name Abimelech. In Hebrew that means son of a king. So you see where his mind is going, his heart is going as a king. And then what happens? He gets a good old age and he goes to be buried. The next failure or enemy coming in, number eight, when he was dead, the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam. Balaam is a plural of Baal. You see them at the Museum of the Bible, a little image you have in your houses. In the temples, there will be big images. He was a god of land productivity, a god of, of um, what do you call that? <laughs> productivity and having children. And also, he'd be over the weather and different things. This god Baal. He took many different forms very adaptable throughout time in the Old Testament. So they went away right after he died. What happens? His son that was born of the concubine from a foreign woman, not a Jew. This Ambliac, Abibliac, verses 1 to 6, chapter 9, we must include chapter 8 and 9 to go together to really finish the story because we're going to see what happens is that he went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren. This brethren isn't physical brethren. It's those that were from that city. And commune with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, 
Speak, I pray to you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem. Whither is better for you that his 70 sons reign over you as king or I reign over you as king? You have 70 sons that are going to be reigning. You're going to have to pay all their support and income and just me. I'd like to do it. So he's still a son. And what do they say he does? He's a politician too, getting power. Verse 4. And he gave them three score. Wait, wait. I go to back three. And his mother's brethren spoke of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, all these words, and their hearts were inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, he is our brother. He's of the same nation. He's of the same culture. He's born of the same mother. He's not a Jew. He's a politician too. So this seemed good in their hearts. Were their hearts right? No. And they gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Berit. Again, Baal, they gave him 70 pieces of silver. What for? Well, he took them silver and he hired 70, well, he hired men to kill the 70 brothers that were born of Gideon, of his wife. So they took one piece of silver per person. And that word Baal Bereth means Baal of the covenant. They're making a mockery of a covenant. They have a covenant or promise with Baal, their God. Not like Abraham and a covenant that God makes through Abraham, through the land of Israel, to the people. He made covenants. Well, they have covenants with their false gods, too. Promises with them. Very similar. Judges 8.33 he uses the same term, Baal. Remember when he was younger and he, God told him, go destroy the Baal. And it was his own family, his father's house that had a Baal to worship. The Jew. And then he did in the nighttime because he was a coward. That Nobody would see him, so he did it in the night. And they found out about it. Then his father, but that Baal worship has not left. They're going back to it. And they destroyed them all on a stone, one stone. He slew them all, cut their heads off, all 70 of them. These men that were hired to do it. So he had no competition. He was put king. Verses 7 through 21 is a parable. This is the first parable in the Bible, the Old Testament. He's going to tell a story about trees, three types of trees. First would be an olive tree, a fig tree, a vine, and then a bush. A bramble, it calls it. And these trees represent the first three represent Israel, the people of Israel, and also the Holy Spirit. Because through the Spirit, God spoke through the prophets. He created everything. Let's look at the first one. Well, first, verse 7. The son, one son of the 70 escaped. His name is Jotham. He's going to play a key role here. So Jotham who escaped the 70 being slain, he goes to Mar Mount Gerizim. When the Jews entered from the desert into the promised land, there were two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. On one side, they yelled, this is what you have to do to be blessed. On the other side, this is what you have to do to be cursed. And he stood upon the mountaintop Speaking down to the city of Sukkoth, where they were, not Sukkoth, this is uh, Shisham. It was one of the largest cities in that time. And he's given this words, he's yelling it at them down in the city. And he lifted his voice and cried and said to them, hearken to me, you men of Shechem that God may hearken to you. You listen to me, that God will listen to you. 
Are they going to listen? Well, the trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign over us. And then the olive tree said, should I leave my fatness, my health, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go and be promoted over the trees? Then he uses the same thing with the fig tree in verses 10 and 11. The fig, should I forsake my sweetness? The fig is sweet. And my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees. Then said the trees to the vine, Come thou, reign over us. And the vine said, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, to go to be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, this is like these Israel says unto the bramble, which is there's a, a fire, and he's going to talk about a fire. The trees are Israel. And Israel is like the burning bush tree. God has blessed it, has called it, made it holy and separate. But the bramble, and they're big, this little bramble is a small bush like and there's a little picture on the, the screen that doesn't give fruit and it can catch fire and there's a difference we'll see about these fires that it, they're going to give up the fire of God to let this bramble burn them take care of them with the uncontrolled fire with the unholy fire a consuming fire. The fire of God in us is a non-consuming. We don't get destroyed from it. We get healthy and produce figs that are sweet. We produce olives that serve their sweetness and fatness, their purpose, that God's design. So that's the difference between this. We'll see the, the parable he's going to talk about. What did the tree said unto the bramble? Come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, now they aren't really talking, but that's a parable. If in truth you anoint me king over you, the bramble is um, Abimelech, if you put me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow, and if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So this little bramble is going to devour the cedars of Lebanon, which are up in Tyre and the Phoenicians up north, where they got the great woods and great trees that they built the temples from. And David used later and and at uh, different times when they rebuilt the temple, they got them from up there, left these cedars. Then let's go down to verse 20. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Melo, and let fire come out from men of Shechem and from the house of Melo and devour Abimelech. So he gives this parable that's also a prophecy. It's come to be fulfilled within maybe 10, we don't know the time period. He, he reigned for 40 years. He was over Israel. They had peace after he got the victory over the Midianites. So this could have been years later. We don't know when it was. But verse 22, 10, is God, well, Abimelech reigned over Israel three years. Three years after Gideon died, he's already went to be with God in the Hall of Fame, Hebrews 11. But what about verse 23? And I see that as God allows the enemy to come in when it's because he needs to be just. He needs to punish. And he says, 
God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. After three years, it shows the spirit of God, how powerful it is. He could speak to a whole nation at one time or raise up leaders. It wasn't until after three years. That's what trusting the spirit, seeking God, trusting him, and that the spirit will bring about that, what needs to be brought, and if not, God will avenge if there's wickedness, evilness, destruction, division. The seven Bs that are happening within Abimelech and Gideon because of his failure, his compromise, because he's doubting the word of God. We don't see Gideon praying at all now. He worshiped God once before when he revealed things. He's not praying, he's not seeking, he's just, and his son in these chapters too. So there's going to be a battle and he's going to raise up a guy named Gail. He's like a mercenary, verses 26, 41. Not going to read that. But he goes in and says, you shouldn't serve Abimelech, I'll help you conquer him. And they side with him. We're going to get rid of Bevania because the spirit of God is making them do it. <laughs> Raising up this person. However, he's not victorious. And what happens? The, the 12, he ends up destroying Shechem. In verse 43, and he took the people and divided them into three companies. He's doing like his father did, Gideon. He remembers. He divided them into three groups of a hundred. He's trying to imitate. When God was working, the devil comes in and tries to imitate with his consuming fire that's destructive. It starts with doubt, disappointment, dissatisfied, despair, keeps on going on to depression and death. So we got to catch those bees at the doubt. What does God say in his word? And not let it go further. Or else we, those other things fall in place when it doesn't work out the way we want it. But he's trying to imitate his father. Three companies. And they go and beat down the city, verse 45, and so it was salt. They put salt, so it's no good anymore. Check them. And then he kills a thousand men and women. What else does he do? He takes some bushes and sets them on fire to set the temple or the, the tower on fire. And he says, what we have, you have seen me do, make haste, do as I have done. The same as his father Gideon when he said, break those lanterns and show those lights. He's imitating his father's victory, which was God-given. But he's trying to imitate it. This is the way the enemy comes in, too, imitating the true with a counterfeit. It won't work for him. And then Abimelech, he gets killed by a woman and throws it down from the tower in Tabiz. He's going to a new city, Thabes, in verse 50. And then this woman throws down a stone in verse 54. He asks his armor bearer to draw the sword and slay me, that men may not say of me, a woman slew me. His last words. That men won't say a woman slew me. So that's dying words. And we can see where it ended. And verse 56 to end with, Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech which he did unto his father in slaying his 70 brothers. And all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads. Vengeance is of the Lord. He took care of everything. And we want to be on the, the side of Gideon and victory, and not when we get older, especially, to kind of depart and go astray some way. Uh, this puts the fear of the Lord in me, because... We can never think we're fall. We, we're, we're, um, we can't fall. 
We, we can't think we have the victory in, in a way that's not of faith, solely faith. Um, that's how in the next two weeks we're going to look at the three, the four judges and compare and contrast and how we can look at this variety of circumstances through and what we can apply in our lives. Because these are written for our learning. They can happen to any of us. And, and maybe it'll speak to us because we want to be cautioned ahead of time. <laughs> hey, I'm going the wrong way. Or we want to be confirmed. Hey, I'm going the right way. I want to continue. And stronger and stronger until the day of the rapture or the day we go to be with the Lord, our bodies on this earth, to the grave, we go to sleep, but our soul is present with the Lord. That's how I'm going to finish this. Lord God, be with Alan as he's going to come send us, do a special song, and as we, uh, the breakfast tomorrow, Bob Evans at 8 o'clock, and especially with Sunday. We pray your mercies, Lord God. Is you're a God of love, but you're a God that's holy. And to see both sides of you. And this is a sanctuary, Lord. Where we want your presence with the, the non-consuming fire. The fire that will quicken us and enliven us to be filled with your spirit. More and more is your people. And that you will work among us in whatever way we need it, Lord. Through your mercies and through your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Yeah, God sending the evil and that's it's just like God repented of destroying Nineveh. Does God repent? He has mercy. He has pity. But yes, in his time, like we think the tribulation, we believe the wrath of God will come uh, sometime in the future. God's going to allow it. And if you put allow or sin, uh, that's deep theological. That's his holiness, though. We like to see his love. We don't want to see his holiness as much. And to have that balance, he's a just God. And uh, so I kind of, I believe he did send it. Just like he spent, sent an evil spirit to King um, Saul when David comforted him with playing the music. He says, God sent him upon Saul. Good evening, guys. Send, uh, send revival start with me by Petra. How's everybody doing this evening? Good, good. of old that if we pray and humble ourselves you will come and hear our land you will come you will come we're looking to the promise you made that if we turn and look to your faith And hear our land, you will come, you will come to us. Lord, send revival, start with me, for I am one.
And my eyes have seen the King Your glory I have glimpsed Send a revival star with me And revival start with me For I am one of unclean lips And my eyes have seen the King Your glory I have glimpsed Send a revival Start with me Amen Alright, you want to pray real quick? Okay, Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you and praise you for this evening. Lord, we thank you for the word. I pray, Father God, that uh, you would uh, keep us all safe as we leave this evening, Father God. And I just want to praise you and thank you so much for so many blessings from the expression of your love, oh, Father God. Father, I thank you that we are perfect and blameless because through the blood of Jesus Christ, you see us is that way, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Lord God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for everyone here in this evening, Lord. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. <laughs>